We conclude our sermon series today that has focused on these two words that Jesus spoke, I am. Each week over the past month or so, we have taken a different passage from the Gospel of John where Jesus uses these words, I am, and then compares himself to something from everyday, ordinary life. In doing so, he reveals something to us about his character, his nature, what God's desires and intentions are of us and for us. We've looked at how Jesus said, I am a shepherd, I am a vine, I am bread, I am a light. And today we conclude. And it is only fitting perhaps that we conclude this sermon series where Jesus' life concludes, and that is on the cross. That's where we find him in our scripture reading today. He has been sentenced to death. The soldiers are leading him out from Pilate's headquarters. And this is what happens next. I'm reading from John chapter 19, verses 16 through 19, and then 23 through 30. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now his tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scriptures, which said, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots, and this they did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. And after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. Now, there was a jar full of wine standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for this day, for this opportunity to be gathered here around this word this morning. And as we do so, I pray that you open our hearts, our minds, bless me with the words that you would have us hear today. And if that word is indeed pleasing to you, God, I pray that it finds a home in our hearts and in turn bears much fruit in our lives when we leave this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. And I believe with these three words, he reveals to us the fullness of his humanity. He was one of us. He was fully human like us because he was thirsty. And that is something to which we can relate. We, normal, everyday human people, supernatural people, probably don't need to get thirsty. But we, we get thirsty. As Hannah described in her children's message, we've all had that sensation of being so parched. It feels like we've been holding cotton balls in our mouth all day. 
or, or, or the sensation of, of not wanting to lick our lips because we're afraid they'll stick together and we won't have the strength to unstick them. It's part of the human condition to be thirsty, really dehydrated thirsty. And so if for Jesus to be thirsty, it means that he is one of us, that he's human. And really, that's what he's been showing us his whole ministry, that he knows what it's like to be us because he's one of us. Jesus wept. Jesus wept at the tomb of his good friend Lazarus. Just as we weep and cry and mourn and wail, at the wakes and visitations and coffins and caskets of our loved ones. He's one of us. Once, Scripture says, Jesus passed by a fig tree, and when he saw the fig tree, he was hungry. Just as our stomachs will growl when we smell something really appetizing. And when Jesus noticed that the fig tree didn't have figs on it to satiate his hunger in that moment, he cursed the tree. He cursed it. He was angry. Now bear in mind, this is not righteous anger like he would display when he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, or when he cast the money changers out of the the temple. No, this is frustration the kind of impatient frustration we feel when we don't get what we want, when we want it, in the matter that we'd prefer it be delivered to us. He's one of us. When Jesus cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's a fear in those words, a fear of loneliness, the kind that we feel when we're in the dark valley and maybe, just maybe, we're all alone. You know, it's one thing to be stuck in the valley of darkness, and it's another thing to be in that valley alone. He's one of us. And when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, he said to the guards, I've been doing this for three years, and you're just coming now to arrest me? And sometimes when I read those words, I, I, I hear apprehension and nervousness and trepidation the kind that we feel when we don't know exactly what the next moment is going to bring, but there's an ominous and a foreboding feeling that we have when thinking about it. I once had a church member who was so fixated and obsessed with the Jesus we don't read about in Scripture. Every time we talked about Jesus, every time we opened the Bible for Bible study, she would say, what about the Jesus we don't read about? I wonder what that Jesus was like, what he did, what he would do, what he was thinking. And I said then, every time she brought it up, something I say now, which is I don't know. But I do know from the Jesus we do read about in Scripture that he felt at the very core of his being what we feel at the core of ours. He's one of us. The prophet Isaiah said that God has compassion on us, God's children. God has compassion on us. And that word compassion, first in Greek and then uh, through Latin, has a connotation of, of having your guts stirred up, feeling at your visceral level, at the gut level, what somebody else is enduring. Compassion. You see, Jesus could experience in his gut what we experience in ours because he experienced it in his gut too. In the figure of Jesus, God made flesh to dwell among us. We see the connection, the compassion, and the closeness of God most clearly. He's one of us. You know, before Jesus came, there was distance between God and humanity. There was a barrier of sorts between God and the people. And we don't blame God for that, and we don't negatively judge our spiritual ancestors for that. It's just the way Scripture tells us that things were. In Genesis chapter 1, on the second day of creation, 
we are told that there was a separation between heaven and earth, a spatial barrier between the two. A barrier between God and the people. And in, in Babel, when the people tried to build a tower to climb, to bridge the gap between the two, and to reach up in that upper realm, well, we know what happened. They fell down and were dispersed throughout the earth, scattered by different languages. A barrier between God and people. And we're told that when the priests carried the Ark of the Covenants, which held the Ten Commandments on long poles, we're told that anyone who touched the Ark, the presence of God, who wasn't an authorized priest, would die instantly barrier between God and people. And when Moses went up on the mountain to meet God to receive the law and to write it down and bring it back down to the people, we're told that he had to veil his face, barrier between God and people. That the presence of God was so powerful that there had to be a barrier, a wall protecting people from it. And maybe no place was this seen more clearly than in the temple in the holy house in Jerusalem. Because, as we've said before, in the inner sanctum, in the innermost chamber, the Holy of Holies of the temple in Jerusalem was where the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments were stored. And this was the, the actual, literal, very place where God dwelled, the presence of God writ large. And we're told that there was a physical barrier between that presence and everything else in, in, in the world. And that barrier was a, a curtain that extended from the floor to the ceiling. And that barrier was so symbolically strong that only one person could penetrate it, could move past it. And that person was the high priest, and only he could do that one day a year on the Day of Atonement. Everywhere the people looked, you see, there was a wall, distance, a barrier between God and them. But we are told that the very first thing that happened when Jesus died, shortly after he said these words, I am thirsty, was that that curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You see, the barrier in Jesus Christ was broken down and forever altered. And really, Jesus had been showing us that his entire life. From the moment he came to us, he came as one of us. And in so doing, he brought the barriers between God and humanity down. He was born like us. And he grew like we grow. He was baptized like us. And he prayed like us. He wept like us. He was afraid like us. He talked with us and He laid His hands on us. He ate at our tables and drank from our wineskins. And He took our children up in His arms. You see, no barriers, no walls, no distance, no division, no separation, no curtain. Just closeness. How do we know that God is with us? Because in the figure of Jesus, God is is one of us. And we saw this God with our very eyes and we touched this God with our very hands. Not only not harmed by that, but infinitely more blessed by that. So as we journey forward and leave this sermon series in the rearview mirror and move on to the next step on our path, may we remember these important things that we have talked about over these past seven weeks. I've printed them on the yellow insert in your bulletin if you want to take that home and refer to them. But let us remember that we all matter. We are all of value to God. You are of value to God. I am of value to God. And so are they. And them, whoever they are, they matter too. Let us remember that, that Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us, is with us now on this path that we walk. 
and is not just out there in the future waiting for us to arrive at some finish line. This journey, this path that we're on is redemptive and life-giving and transformative, even though it may not seem like it, and even though we, from time to time, have dips and swells and valleys that we go through. This pathway is healing and redemptive. Let us remember that on this pathway there will be temptations to steer off of it and to follow other attractive lights that are shining over there and over there. And they will be very appealing and very luring to us. But they will not be lasting. They will not be lasting. They ultimately can't sustain. So let us stick close. Let's stick close and abide to Christ. Abide with Him as branches to a vine, it will pay dividends for us that might not be imaginable to us now but are there. And as we stay close to him, let us not give up on him. He doesn't give up on us. And he sees potentialities and possibilities for us that may not yet be visible to us. And as we stay close and as we cling on that path, let us know that he is indeed with us. And never doubt that because he is one of us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for being so close to us as we are to ourselves and bringing your very presence, your life-giving presence, up close and personal to us in the lives that we lead. May this strengthen us as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen.